Hi, I'm Brian Batt, and today I have the pleasure of chatting with uh, a legend, an icon in Southern literature, the one and only Kenneth Holditch. How are you, Kenneth? I'm fine. Great. I'm, I'm hanging in there. I first had the pleasure of meeting you many years ago. Uh, Betty Buckley, uh, my dear friend Betty Buckley, was in town, and she wanted to take one of your legendary literary tours. Yes. But it was the dead of summer, and you were a little reticent, but you, you, you acquiesced, and it was one of the most magical nights yes. I've ever had. Uh, it was wonderful. I remember it very fondly. Every moment of it, every drop of liquor. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's 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 go back in time. What brought you to to be to become so enamored and and, and dedicate your life's work to literature? Well, I don't know. I think it's. I think it's something in the water in Mississippi. <laughs> but we have produced more writers than any other state, with the possible exception of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them might be, it can rank mm -hmm. higher than Mississippi writers, but it's just that everybody in, in Mississippi and his dog <laughs> written a book, uh, at least one, and sometimes many, uh, I knew a, a lady in Oxford, Mississippi, who have, had books stored away in her attic that she had written and nobody would agree to publish. And oh. I don't know what ever happened to them. <laughs> but but uh, there, it's just something about Mississippi. Yeah. And so I, it came naturally, I suppose, to me to be a writer. There were no writers in my family. Uh -huh. uh, I, I, I can't think of think of a single one, well, but I was, uh, I was born six miles from where Faulkner was born, mm -hmm. and my great-grandfather served under Faulkner's great-grandfather in the Civil War. Oh, wow. And he, they were friends, our great-grandfathers, and uh, Faulkner's great-grandfather built a his railroad across my great-grandfather's land, and my great-grandfather made some money from that. It was lost by the time my generation came along. But uh, obviously that had an influence on me. And I was born 70 miles from where Tennessee was born. Wow. Tennessee Williams. So uh, there is something. And of course there's Eudora Wealthy and God yeah. knows how many other people. So many. So, such a hotbed of talent. Literary yes. talent. Down there. So now you're from a crew, a crew, Mississippi? A crew, Mississippi. And uh, what, oh, there's someone else you went to high school with that, or school with that was yes. famous. I, I hold here a copy of a library card with your name and Elvis Presley's name on it yes. as well. So you went to school with Elvis. Yes. What was that I, like? I, I've said in recent years that on my tombstone it will probably say, he went to school with Elvis. <laughs> That's one of the, I guess I'm, there are not many of us left of that, that age, True. but Elvis was 18 months younger than I was. Mm -hmm. Did you know, so, was he special at that age, or did you, was he just a regular no, guy? You know, well, first of all, uh, there were not 119 people in my class in, in Tupelo Junior High School and high school, and so we didn't even know those young people. You know, <laughs> it would have been uh, déclassé to have had anything to do with those, those wow. younger than us. So he performed in 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 uh, assembly program, mm -hmm. uh, country music. Old, my old old tray, I think, mm -hmm. is the name of, of the song he performed. And I'm sure we laughed. And I remember hearing him. I think I remember that we were also laughing and stopping our feet and making fun. <laughs> but uh, no, we were, and then he he performed at the Mississippi Alabama Fair and Dairy Show. Mm -hmm. My cousin David Baker gave him his second prize in the contest. A young woman won first prize and nobody remembers. Yeah, where is she now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. She so sort of disappeared. Yeah. But uh, we have no idea that that he, I mean, it, it still boggles the mind to, to think that he came from such a poor, I mean, it's just in an mm -hmm. unbelievably poor background and mm -hmm. that he's gone as far as he did. Yes, he's amazing. Now, you um, you did this wonderful literary tour, but 
you're pretty much an expert on New Orleans literature. And so what do you think makes New Orleans such a literary hub? Uh, is it the, the quarter? Is it the atmosphere? Like Mississippi, okay. it's very similar in, in topography to Mississippi. I think it's the quarter, and I think it's, uh, you know, of course, Mississippians, half, of, half the people in New Orleans are from Mississippi. Um, they all, we all flocked down here as soon as we got old enough to leave home. Not because we disliked mm -hmm. uh, Mississippi, but because the lure of the quarter. I came here with my parents when I was, was uh, I was 17 years old, and, and I said, you know, this is the place I've got to live. And my father said, oh, you don't want to live there. <laughs> you don't want to live in a city. You know, we've grown up in a small town, and so did I. And so he said, uh, I said, yes, when I get old enough, I'm going to. So as soon as I could get a job at the University of New Orleans, I, I came here. But I think there's a, you know, there's not just the, the Mississippi talent and the other talent that came here from all over the country. Right. But it's also the fact that there's this wonderful tradition and history uh, that the, uh, oh, what, what can you say? It's just the magic of yeah. New Orleans. Well, isn't it, you've, you've said, many people have said that uh, New Orleans, especially the French Quarter, is the last bastion of Bohemia. Yes. You know, yes. and I think there's some, isn't there some kind of, that's what also attracted Tennessee Absolutely. to the quarter. Tennessee said, I found in New Orleans kind of freedom I had always needed, and the shock of it against the Puritanism of my, my system mm -hmm. gave, me the, gave me the material I've been writing about ever since. The wow. thing that only thing that surprises people about that that line, I think, is is, is referring to himself as a Puritan. <laughs> but it is true that that he came from a Puritan oh, yes. background. Oh yes, so grandfather. I, mm -hmm. You know, I've got a history, a long history of Calvinistic ancestry, stretching back into the the mists of Scotland centuries ago, and uh, he had much the same background as a number of, of uh, New England Puritans yeah. as well. Yeah. But so he came to New Orleans to be free in, in, in a sexual sense. Right. And artistic as well, yeah. As well. But do you think that also the Puritan, the, the, the strict religious upbringing, that coupled with the artistic and the Bohemian caused uh, a tumultuous uh, relationship within him and I created these characters? Tension, yes. Yeah. Uh, Clint Brooks, one of the greatest, greatest uh, uh, critics of, Amer of literature, had said that, uh, that uh, all of literature is the result of tension, mm -hmm. uh, tension between this, that, and the other. And Tennessee said it was because his father uh, was such a, a rascal, <laughs> a drinker, and a card player. card game, uh, uh, whereas Miss Edwina, the mother, uh, was a very strict uh, Episcopalian. Mm -hmm. Her parents were, her father was an Episcopal minister, of course, Day and time. that contrast, I think, was a wonderful, I think those are wonderful elements to go to make a, to make a, uh, a writer. And of course, there's also what David Kaplan Critic David Kaplan mm -hmm. has called Mississippi Magic Tone, yeah. which Tennessee possessed to the extreme. And his use is incredible vocabulary, but also he was also a fantastic poet. And there was this yeah. this this poet aspect to his work as well, yes. in in short stories and 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 as of course in his plays. Um, Faulkner said that uh, all novelists are failed poets, and I think we might say the same about Sam Duff. Tennessee started out being a poet, and mm -hmm. he himself said, I was a minor poet, and then he became a major, major playwright. playwright. As a matter of fact, I would venture to say at this point, America's greatest playwright. I would agree with you. Yeah. I would I definitely agree with you. Um, I, you know, Tennessee has so many, uh, there's his popular hits, you know, yes. and then he has so many that did not, we were just discussing earlier, uh, The Unsatisfactory Supper. And really, I remember seeing a wonderful uh, production by the acting company, I think it was called Ten by Tennessee, yes. and they did all the one acts. 
out of his most popular works, I know this is like picking your favorite child, but what would be one of your favorites? Night of the Iguana. Night of the Iguana. It is the most, it makes me cry to, to read it. There's some great, great lines in that play. So oh many yeah, great lines, great characters. Incredible. Now, out of Tennessee's lesser known uh, one acts and pl or, or non successful uh, works, what, what, what would your favorite be among them? Hmm. Uh, when when uh, Mel Gusso and I were editing the two volumes of Lucy Williams' play, <coughs> the Library of America. Uh, I saw the volumes of the, for the Library of America. You have quite a few, yeah. quite a few uh, editions in there. Two volumes. Uh, yeah, we've got. I think eight, they gave us eight hundred pages for the two volumes, and they paid us a pittance. <laughs> But it was it was a lot for me. It was my life's crowning achievement to be able to write for the to be able to work for the the uh, Library of, of America, which was established uh, by Edmund Wilson, the great critic, and uh, all of the major American writers were to be included, and most of them have been at this point. Also, some minor ones have crept in, but we won't go into that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wanted to put in Gil Carre and Mel Gusto, my co-editor, who was the, the drama critic for the New York Times, uh, didn't like that play. And he wanted to put in uh, Tennessee's comedy. I can't think of it. So I agreed. Finally, we compromised. You can have your comedy in there, but I can have Gil Carre. It's the young man who's left St. Louis and come to New Orleans and lives in a boarding wow. house, rooming house mm -hmm. in, in the French Quarter, and it's really a guy, and it's, it's just a beautiful reconstruction of what, what the, the quarter was like in those days. Oh, well, that's great. Now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Tell us about uh, a student in Walker, Walker Percy's legendary class at Loyola with, uh, I think, uh, Walter Isaacson was there, and Tim Gutro and Valerie uh, Martin. Valerie Martin. Yeah. Yes, and we, uh, we were, and Valerie, of course, had been a student of mine and, and had written her first short story in my creative writing class. And she recently, within the last three years, published a book for, for you, maybe, uh, which was the dedication read uh, to Dr. Kenneth Holdridge, who got me started. How beautiful. And to my students who keep me going. <laughs> I thought it was so precious and I'll cherish it. But she was in the class, Walter Isaacson was in the class, and Walker Percy taught it, Tim Gozo. Wow. Uh, who's become another yes. a story writer. And, and I was there, more or less from, the, I think, the fifth server. I was working on a novel which came to naught. I told Walker I wanted to be in the class, and he said, but you've been teaching creative writing yourself. And I said, yes, but I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. And he said, I'm going to turn to you if there's anything. <laughs> so anyway, we had a lot of fun. That's uh, we, we had wine and cheese every, every week, and we did met once a week at Loyola. And our final exam was held in this house. Oh, wow. And there was a great deal of It was a great experience being in Walker's yeah. class. <laughs> Another great literary figure of New Orleans, uh, John Kennedy Toole. Yes. You also became friends with his, his mother, who yes. is, uh, the character in the book was based on, if not <laughs> completely. No, I don't. I you didn't base the, the mother on her? her? No. Oh, no? Okay, then good. Good. No, All right. No, I don't know why I thought no that. Oh, well, that's good. Good to hear, because uh, uh, she was a, quite Kennedy a character. Kennedy Toole's mother was a very well-educated woman. Mm -hmm. And she, I remember once I was going to New York, and she said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to do, one thing I'm going to do is the Metropolitan Opera as a Verdi opera I've never seen go to Hernani. And she started singing an aria. Oh, my gosh. And Hernani is not a well-known no. opera by any means. But... Uh, 
very interesting because she had brought her son a novel from Bethesda Junction uh, to the War Professors, and she cornered him and brought it over there mm -hmm. to offer it to him. And he didn't want to read it, though he never knew how to say no to people. Mm -hmm. He read a lot of manuscripts that people brought him that took time away from his from his teaching and his philosophy and, and reading and writing. And he brought two of the uh, he brought the novel to the class, and he read two of the chapters to us, and we were amazed. And they were published, two of those two chapters were published in the New Orleans Review, which was published at Loyola, and this was in, it was in their 10th year, and it was a special issue, and Don Lee Keith got me to review that for him. Don Lee was the, in charge of editorial writing for the Duke of Lake Julia, so I reviewed that that issue, and this is still follow me on the phone, my review was so positive, it said almost nothing about anything else in the, in the journal but the Keith chapter of the Junction Review, and she called me and said, oh, she was so delighted that you had read, oh. and she said, I want you to come see me, and the irony is that it turned out she lived three blocks from me here for some reason. <laughs> public option, and I was so horrified by that that I said, all right, go ahead and publish it, so it was published. It was, okay. Yeah. It's sad that, that they wouldn't respect her, her wishes like that. I know. It's just unkind. Um, but subsequently, so w in the timeline, uh, when did it get published, uh, uh, Confederacy of Dunces? After the two chapters were written and your, your critique? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. she would, his, the mother well, was... No, my, my critique was, was written right before the on the way to being published. Yeah, so, yeah. but she was really responsible for getting it published, and oh then yeah. it, then it won the Pulitzer. Definitely. So yeah. it's it's extremely That's proud. The she, obviously, Irene Riley, the mother, is mm. a Confederate. Yes, so totally. I'm gl that's a misconception because uh, some people naturally thought that that's so. I'm I'm glad you set that straight. Well, she, there's she gets a bad rap, Elma Julian, but she was a she was a strong will. Exactly. Well, that's that's a tenacious Southern lady. There's there's many yeah. of them, you know, very strong Southern belles. I'd speak like there was a misconception I had about her, but what there's also uh, so many misconceptions about Tennessee Williams. Yeah. You know that uh, uh, you know when he passed, it was unfortunate um, that a lot of writing was done about his, his Blue Devils or his his problems, yeah. and instead of lauding his great success and his great art, would you care to? Talk about the, some of the misconceptions of Tennessee. Well, I, I think probably that not, that he had no no more blue devils than any other writer. He just wrote. He, he, he talks about it as openly. Mm -hmm. Most writers, I think, tend to yeah, huh? cover, keep them to themselves and cover them up. But uh, he was very open about the way they were spinning for Fabie Faulkner. Had a great many problems. 
he converted it into water to encourage Timothy William, but but it became clear that he was talking about himself and who he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a certain sense, you know, I think uh, Dostoevsky's that suffering is the origin of consciousness, mm-hmm. and I think that's the way to look at it. It's, it's true. Yeah. And there's also something freeing about writing about it. It's almost there. Sometimes it can be therapeutic, yeah. or just dealing with it. Right. Uh, but um, no one, no one did it like Tennessee. Well, Tennessee. When I was around Tennessee, he was he had a great deal of wonderful sense of humor, very wry and mm-hmm. sometimes somewhat caustic and bitter. But but there was, and there was a great deal of sorrow. Uh, he had a very funny attitude towards sorrow. He. Uh, he met William Faulkner twice, just twice, in passing, mm-hmm. although I had used Mr. Faulkner. And uh, he was asked what he would think of Faulkner, and he said, I met Mr. Faulkner, and he said, you know, he had the saddest eyes I've ever seen. Huh. And he said, I looked into those eyes, and I immediately burst into tears. Now, I don't believe that he said that. <laughs> Tennessee possessed this ability to to really go into the human psyche. He had his thumb, I think, yeah. right on th- these innate characteristics that that make yeah. or that made such great literary characters. But yeah. some of that might have been it, it seems so real that it, it, that you could you would know these people. He would have been a great psychiatrist, I think. Mm-hmm. If he could actually go <laughs> Uncanny, yes. That's one of the great things about him. Uh, he, he, in the first few plays, uh, The Last Menagerie and Peter and Desire, changed the course of, of American drama and world drama, ultimately. Uh, those two together, they freed uh, American drama from the social uh, protest Yes, the fugitive kind that he dubbed them. Yes, that he it wasn't just kings that you know high. It was the real people, you yeah. know, and brought and open open our eyes to them. Uh, now, also, there's another wonderful artist. I'm looking around your home, and it is filled with these gorgeous works by uh, by George Durow. Yes. Um, another not a literary uh, figure, but a definitely an artistic yes. icon uh, uh, from New Orleans art. Do you care to talk about? Your friend George? Well, George and I were friends. So I met George in 1969, and I bought uh, a, a portrait from the Orleans Gallery that he was doing that in that 69 uh, showing, and it wasn't finished. And George said, Well, you can come by my gallery anytime you buy my apartment, anytime you want to, and, and do this with your painting. Well, it took him a year to do <laughs> I was glad two or three times a week to get an invitation 
and he was a wonderful cook. Mm. And he loved to have people present when he was doing the cooking and he said, Now he put a pinch of this, he put a pinch of that. And he was a good cook. Uh, he was also very critical of other people's cooking. He said, I never he never had a meal at my house that he didn't tell me how I could have made it better. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I was very proud of my, my stuffed peppers. I did that to him. He said, mmm, his wife was not, she was not keen. He said, those are very good peppers, Ken. They're stuffed with crisps. You could have made them a little better had you put some brandy in the stuffing. I think that's so again, I berated him for, <laughs> for that. But, uh, but he kept on coming back for dinner. He kept on coming back. <laughs> Dementia? Uh, no, the name of that. Uh, oh, 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 the Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's yeah. disease, yes. And the last person in the world I would have thought he would have, he would have gotten it because he had a, a mind like a steel trap. Mm -hmm. And it worked beautifully. It was very, it was very philosophical, like, like when they say he understood suffering. Certainly. Yeah. Well, you can see that in his art. Yes, and portrayed the, 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 the fugitive kind. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I have some 25 of his works, and uh, I cherish our, our relationship. Now, several times I know you've told me in the past, like, I think you um, went to a wonderful restaurant with him and many other literary characters and artistic characters, Galatoires, and you also wrote a book. Yes. One of your many books, about yes. one of them on, on Galatoires. Yes, uh, Marta Burton and I did, did this book on Galatoires. It took us, I think, five years we worked on it. And people said, um, oh, you must have, they must have given you a lot of, of free meals at Galatoire. They gave us no free meals at Galatoire. <laughs> we bought every meal we had that. Uh, Mr. Von Galatoire did give, did give me a, a bottle of champ Bud Pico champagne mm -hmm. once because I had carried, I had given her a book on Titanic, but that was something, something different. totally different. But that was wonderful. But George and I spent a lot of time at restaurants, the Beasley's. Oh, a lot. well, he did that wonderful mural yeah, in, in yeah. Sabisa's, yes. And we, we exchanged that mural for eating at, at, at the store. He called up the, the bill, and, and it was so big. We were eating 18 months later. We, we, we were dining <laughs> there almost two or three nights a week. Oh, great. And also a wonderful restaurant uh, uh, on Rampart Street, I hope you remember it, called John, John Keyes. Oh, yes. John Thurman owns yeah. that. He was a former priest, and he owns that restaurant. Uh, but, uh, oh, I forgot to say when I was talking about Galatoire, but Marta Burton and I did this together, and I guess that news has passed through, but we're Marta's death and hers to love. Yes. She was lovely. She was a lovely lady. I was on the board of Le Petit Theater with her yeah. for several years, yeah. and she was just such a contributor to the arts mm -hmm. in New Orleans. So, now you're one of the founding members of the Tennessee Williams Festival, and yeah. thank you, thank you for that. But also, uh, you also made it possible for George DeRoe to do some of the first posters for that. But there's also a, I think it was her, uh, someone told me about a wonderful meeting when you met Tennessee and your friend Don Lee one night at the Mahalia Jackson Theater.
that prophet to Christ in, in, in New Orleans. And I said, well, they're, they, uh, they, they're going up. I said, property is becoming more expensive. And he said, well, that's good. He said, I, I bought property wherever I went. He said, I'm just like a sly old fox. <laughs> Well, you've you've um you've written several publications and books about Tennessee. I've done six books. Yes, that's great. I co-edited those volumes of plays, the work of which I'm I'm most proud of is Tennessee 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 It's, it's well, it's a great book it's because incredible. no one else has seen, very few people have seen those photographs. So you're able to share that with the world. Um, you know, what, what, what started you doing the literary walking tour? It's such an interesting concept. And, um, and I found when I took it, I, I hadn't even heard of it. And when Betty Buckley told me about it and wanted to take it, I thought, what a brilliant idea, yeah. you know? Well, you're lucky, Betty Buckley. <laughs> <laughs> it was. We were panting as we yeah. went along, and we went in several uh, air conditioned places. Park House was the mm -hmm. one, and Betty bought a bunch of books there. But uh, it was it was great fun, great stuff. We never. I got the idea because George Riney Key, who was chairman of the English department uh, at the University of New Orleans, called um, me in his office one day and said. I've been asked if I would do a literary tour of the court because he was an authority on early New mm -hmm. Orleans literature. I mean, French literature, oh. Creole literature, and so forth. And he said, I don't have time to do it. Would you be willing to do it? And I said, oh, I'd love to. So I put the tour together for the, the, my, the uh, um, national organization of teachers and mm -hmm. Oh. It was a consensual teaching. It was only for a limited number. They limited it to 40 people. And it was in connection with the class that was being taught on, on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I gave a lecture. And then the next day we had the tour. And we, we did an up-down tour of the bus mm -hmm. up in the morning. And in the evening, we did the walking tour of the quarter. Close to 100 people show 
Yeah. And and it's the having it was it's one of the highlights of I've, I've ever had of, of the French Quarter. Wow. That's amazing. Any other writers that would have taken the tour? Guare, John Guare. Yeah, Guare. Yeah, wonderful uh, playwright. Yeah. We know. Mm -hmm. Ah well, it was it was magical. We knew the French Quarter and well, New Orleans, but the French Quarter especially. Like we said, it's the last bastion of Bohemia, but it's this little enclave of artists and everyone kind of knows everybody in, in a little way or knows of them. Um, walking around the French Quarter, have you ever had any wonderful encounters with literary icons and famous writers just, just by happenstance? Well, there's so I many characters. I, I saw a couple of times when I was leading the tour, and we saw Tennessee Williams, and I was just so to be sad. And I said, now you're just from the living world of Nebraska. And because uh, I didn't know him at first. And after he died, I, I created the Tennessee Williams Wall mm. uh, with Cynthia Radcliffe, my oh, yeah. colleague at UNO. And we put that wall together. So that was but I waited until after the Tennessee had gone from the day. Um, and there are a lot of, there, there are always interesting people in the, in the quarter. Mm -hmm. I remember once one of the great experiences I had at UF, the time was I was walking, the, I was doing the, doing the Tennessee Williams press tour, and I usually did six tours a go. I'm, I can't give them everything or what, but I have colleagues Oh, great. Well, the Tennessee Williams Festival has grown and grown and grown. Yeah. And because, uh, do you know when, when, did, when did they start the Stella Screaming Contest? Was that one of the first things they did, or that was an addition yeah, later on? Fifty years old. It's, you know, I, 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 I was part of it one year. In fact, I read my um, 
the beginnings of my little play, Dear Mr. Williams, at, at the festival, and you were so kind to come to another incarnation of it and help, help uh, uh, thank you, and illu illuminate me with quite some wonderful information on Tennessee Williams. Um, you know, you said on your epitaph, it might say he was friends, with, he went to school with Elvis. Really, what, what uh, as your legacy in literature here in New Orleans, what would you like to be remembered most as? Beautiful. Yeah. That's oh, it. Man, that, <laughs> that was one. I, I might come up with another. <laughs> that's great. Is there anything else you'd like to share? I've gone through all my lists, so. <laughs> well, you know, there's always something more. And I will, as soon as we have quit talking and folded the our camps and have silently stolen away, I will remember any number of things that, that I should have said. I would, yeah. I would say this. If you come to New Orleans, please don't limit yourself to walking along Bourbon Street. Yeah, exactly. There are a lot of things to see on Bourbon Street that are interesting other than the, the bars and the strippers and, and the slap. <laughs> Take a good tour. But uh, there, go see the quarter and 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 learn the history of it. Such an incredible history. And I tried to weave history into my tour. Yes. It, it just drives me crazy that there's so much fantasy and falsehood in stories like the ghost story. Right. Like <laughs> but the, the, the carriages pass, and I've heard them say more than once of lies about this old house, which obviously something right. has happened here. Well, it's like that 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 have happened here, I can tell it. But I've heard them say, uh, recently I heard Harris Traveler say, uh, this, this old house, this antebellum house, was the site of three murders. <laughs> you know, it's like that play Lettuce and Lovage with, oh, yeah. remember, with the giving yeah, the tours, wonderful. and she made up all the these wonderful that's, stories. That's one of the funniest toys I ever had. Wasn't one. it great? And we're going to make a movie of that. Uh, it was so Maggie, Maggie Smith. Smith. Yeah. It was, oh, who's that uh, actress? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Well, you know, there's like, but there's such wealth of, of wonderful stories, wonderful true stories about the French Quarter. Why well, make anything up? Make it up? You know, but what you did with your tours, what I loved so much, is you brought it to life. Right. It wasn't just looking at an icon, a beautiful building and hearing a story. It, it, you brought it to life and made it exciting. And yeah, that's, you. well, you I know, tried. well, you I did. And, and, it was, and it made such an impression, and not just on me, on the thousands of other people that took your tours. I really feel that, that uh, if you walk, if you know, if you know the work, No, that'd be great. Yeah, I welcome so. them. And you, you were speaking of, of things that happened, and one thing that comes to mind is that we turned up there on a two. I interviewed her when she was sitting with me right where mm -hmm. we're sitting now, and she was a fascinating, fascinating woman. And I would urge people to read uh, the Neon Bible, his first book. He wrote when he was 16, Walk of 
person said it was an incredible book. And I was asked to write the introduction for that. And I did. I wrote the introduction. It was made into a movie, by the way, with Gina Rowland. Really? Never got shown much. I don't think it was ever released. It was shown at the Times Film Festival. And that is a mixed review. And so it just, my book with Gina Rowland. Oh. She's brilliant. It's very interesting that, that they've never been able to make the film of Confederacy. I know. It's not, there was a stage version. Uh, a, a friend of mine had some several friends in it, and one of them called me and they said, well, the problem is they don't have a lucky dog cart in the show. <laughs> like, how can you do yeah, the, you the play? Well, you know, I, I did, I wrote, uh, I dramatized scenes from the, the novel. And I had a friend who was a Oh, most I recently, was, yes, right? Done, That's wonderful. Uh, they ran it once the last time they ran, I think, for five years. So oh, yeah. They always do it. Sell out, sold out. And people uh, told me that they, they say the reason they can't make the movie is they can't find an Ignatius, and I think they probably would say looking for a star. Right. What they ought to do is walk down the street and listen <laughs> to people. <laughs> if they come to New Orleans, they can find them. We never had trouble finding an Ignatius. Yes. 